slab on grade. At dawn, the concrete trucks are already there, revving their engines, rumbling and throbbing, one by one maneuvering into position. Enormous insects, on command, they ooze from their huge revolving abdomens, a thick gray slime. Insects attending to insects, the crew fusses over them, nursing wet concrete into the forms. Someone to handle the chute, a couple laborers mucking, one pulling mesh, and two finishers working the screed rod. This is called pouring slab on grade. What could be flatter or more nondescript than a concrete slab? For years, people will walk on it, hardly considering that it was put there on purpose on a Thursday in August by men on their knees. Clem Stark is a poet. He's also been a journeyman carpenter for 40 years. The last 15 here at Oregon State University. He's a specialist, repairing and maintaining things that most of us never even consider. This is my bailiwick. Doors. Doors, door hardware. Yeah. Unlike poetry, carpentry is pretty clear cut whether you know what you're doing or whether you don't, you know. There's a lot of bluffing that goes on in poetry, but there's not a lot of bluffing that goes on in carpentry. His home is a good example, a pioneer era farmhouse Clem reclaimed from the blackberry vines and set to rights in the foothills of the Coast Range. We're on the remnants of an old uh, homestead, about 40 acres outside of Dallas. This is the pump house. <laughs> That's the well head right there. And I poured the slab and then built the house around it to uh, protect the uh, pressure tank and all the valves and the whole pumping system. And then I decided in order to retain my sanity for my teenage kids that I, I, I needed a place to go to do my writing and reading. And so I built a little, uh, you know, desk in there. And uh, that's the pump house. Wrote a lot of poems in there. Up in the pasture, Clem showed us the setting for one of his latest poems. The horse's grave is just over the rise here in a little meadow, which is actually mentioned in the poem in that meadow beyond that fir tree. That's where we found her, just laying there. Just kind of dreading it for a long time because I wasn't sure how to bury a dead horse. <laughs> His approach to writing is unusual, composing an entire poem from beginning to end, all in his head before committing it to paper. How to bury a dead horse. Call Mick Wood. If he can't do it, call Jim King. Then call your boss and tell him you'll be late for work. You've got to bury a dead horse. Putting a poem on the page is really giving a set of instructions for a reader. This is how I'd like you to read this. This is where the emphasis falls. This is where the stresses fall. This is the coloration of the words, you know. And trying to do that is a technique. It's, it's an art. So I hope certainly that on the first uh, reading or the first uh, level of perception that a poem will be a very simple story. But I would like it to have built into it the, the, the kind of interior complexity that enables you to go back and reread it many, many, many times. So that's my hope. Clem Stark's art is his labor, and his labor the substance of his poetry.
And most students at OSU would never guess that this rugged workman is also one of Oregon's best poets. The challenge of being a writer as a professional is to figure out a way to make a living. Since writing is a really labor-intensive, time-consuming job, somehow you got to work in making enough money to keep a roof over your head. Most writers in the United States make their living as teachers. Fewer writers have worked in manual trades, worked with their hands, done uh, blue-collar or middle-class jobs. That is the path Clem Stark has taken. Clem Stark's books are uh, Journeyman's Wages, which won the Oregon Book Award in 1996, Studying Russian on Company Time, and he has a third book forthcoming from Storyline Press called China Basin, Clem Stark. This is uh, out of the ordinary. Ordinarily, I would be, uh, what would I be doing? I'm, I'm working on some doors at Gill Coliseum. This is a group of poems called Looking for Work. Seven poems instead of a resume. One, the plan. My plan was simple. I'd go to some remote, exotic place like Kansas City and get a job, any job, pumping gas or scraping hash browns from the grill in a sleazy diner. I'd I think the, the, the thing that I hope for most is that they'll realize that a poet can be an ordinary guy, just someone who works on doors or on campus, you know? I mean, I'm pretty ordinary in that sense, and that uh, is probably not something that they have uh, considered before. I pack lumber to and from the saw. Poetry has a reputation of being up in the clouds, airy-fairy, you know, and I like to bring it down to earth and convince people of the, of the earthiness of it. It's a sight so beautiful, I'm stunned. Jesus, I say to myself, I've got poems in my head and a hammer in my hand. I can't believe they're actually paying me to be here. <laughs>